Uh, uh, Aaron, very good, very this good. question so, is for you now. It, uh, would this be the first time that any effort has been made to try and bring people or perpetrators of these crimes to book, whether inside of Liberia? Well, outside of Liberia, we know that this has been done with Charles Taylor's, uh, um, uh, the Hague uh, instance. But inside of Liberia, would this be the first time any effort has been put forward? Yes, this is uh, the, the recent... Uh, uh, what we've seen in both uh, the House's representative and the Senate is the latest, and I would say the more uh, the most deliberate actions we've seen in the last uh, 15 years since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report uh, was released to uh, to have a resolution, a joint resolution emanating from the House, and then with the concurrence that we've seen with with the Senate, this is the first this is the first time since the TRC report was. Uh, was released in 15 years, yes. Mm. Right. Um, uh, uh, let's start about the efforts, right? Would this be, um, away from efforts, how has the legacy of war crimes in Liberia affected efforts towards reconciliation and peace building? I want to start with you, Gerald, because I understand you are in Liberia uh, at the moment. Uh, so I was not really getting you clear on the internet. Please uh, repeat. Gerald, I understand your network is uh, giving us a bit of a glitch there. So uh, Aaron, Aaron, if you'd be so kind to answer the question, the legacy of war and uh, or, or, and it's uh, how it's for so uh, uh, reconciliation in Liberia. So uh, the, the legacy, the legacy of war. Uh, let me, for the purpose of this interview, clarify that I'm actually a resident in Liberia. I'm based in Liberia. I'm in the last few months of my PhD study, so just so it doesn't show that uh, I'm speaking as a diasporan, if you like. It's important to clarify that. So, in terms, in terms of the legacy of war in Liberia, there, there are so many different layers. One, uh, one of the legacy of the civil war is that violence is being normalized in Liberia. You have kids engaged into acts of violence that uh, is a carry on from the periods of from the period of the war, because uh, none of these acts committed in wartime has been prosecuted in peacetime. Secondly, there is a correlation between post-war corruption and, and, and wartime impunity. Uh, you find a minister of government think it's okay uh, to get away with one hundred fifty thousand because someone who committed some of the most horrific massacres in Liberia has been uh, elected into the House of Representatives. Some have been elected into the House of Senate. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you f see the current interference in the judiciary uh, where major cases have been interfered with by members of some, some politicians in government. So at multiple layers uh, in post-war Liberia, you see the legacy of the conflict notions of impunity is, is this continual interference in the judiciary and and and, and everyday life? Uh, you you see you see that you see that legacy in different ships in different ships and forms. So yes, uh, in terms of legacy of the war, uh, having an enduring presence and in, 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 uh, impact in the present is is all there. Yeah. Uh, now let's talk about the uh, well influence of external bodies or uh, international bodies when it comes to the vote. Was there any influence from international bodies at, uh, for the realization of this vote by the senators? There has been, there has been uh, some, there has been some involvement. Uh, uh, the, some development partners have expressed a lot of interest in support uh, of the passage of the war crimes court the us the us embassy in liberia has has uh, has been involved uh, the us ambassador at large for on war crimes uh, ambassador ben shark has also uh, been involved i mean her portfolio uh, in the us government you know we suggest that she's in, she's involved and in contact with countries uh, coming out of conflict and but the full extent to which this, the involvement has been, there has been a lot of speculation in terms of the, the extent to which uh, the U.S. Uh, may be influencing a certain outcome. I, I cannot speak to that. That is very speculative. But yes, the U.S. has been involved, has been 
uh, supporting uh, the government of Liberia that is, is 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 mutually beneficial. Again, some of the some of the interests of the U.S. is articulated in how aid, development aid to Liberia is being squandered through corruption. Uh, earlier, I talked about the correlation with with, with, with wartime impunity and post-war corruption. In a way, the the U.S. involvement is in a way concerned with how uh, meaningful uh, development assistance to Liberia is being squandered uh, through acts of corruption. Corruptions, as you mentioned earlier about about legacy, yeah, I see corruption as a big legacy issue. And and will the issue of war crimes uh, address some of this? I think so because attached attached to uh, the resolution, if you look at the resolution signed. Uh, in in both houses, there is an amendment to include a domestic court uh, for economic crimes. So it's not just going to it's not just a process concerned with uh, investigating civil war era atrocities. It's also concerned with economic crimes. In the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, economic crimes is included uh, as one of the measure. I mean, the argument there is that the Liberian civil war was prolonged because of the informal economy that was created. Uh, international businesses were free from issues of taxation because uh, they could engage into uh, a mining rubber, they could engage into mining of iron ore and pay little or no taxes. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission included that, that it, it is important to look at the economic dimension of the civil war and not just uh, the dimension that had to do with uh, the killing, the recruitment, and 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 the rape of, of women in in civil war. There was an economic dimension. So all of these are a major a major element within which uh, the the war crimes code is is been is been designed. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, Gerald, I understand you're back now. Are you with us? Yes, I'm with you. Good. Fantastic. Gerald, uh, this Senate Senate have now vote to establish a war crime court. How are librarians taking the news? Are they excited for this new development? Do they want to see it or do they want more? So it is a split opinion. Uh, certain group of people want this uh, war crimes code to be established in Liberia. And some feel that um, it will uh, derail the reconciliation drive of the country. But as I said, those people who will be appearing before the court if it is established, most of them are powerful people. They are politicians in government and they are politicians at the legislature. They have huge followers. So if they, if they are against the establishment of the court, definitely their people, their followers are not in favor of it. So it's a split opinion. And even though a huge portion of the population want the court to be established while still some followers of these people who are still powerful, who, who committed uh, uh, huge uh, crimes during the war, who bear huge uh, responsibility, their followers are not in favor of the court. So it's a split opinion here in Liberia. Okay, so still on you, Gerard. Now, you also mentioned that there are people in powerful positions who perhaps also committed war crimes during the civil wars. Now, if this goes on, if we have this court, and it takes these people to account, how will this shape or shake the polity in Liberia? Isn't there going to be another rancor up ahead in the future because of this shakeup? Uh, some analysts are suggesting that, of course, there will be uh, some uh, problems. There will be problems associated with the the establishment of the code, especially when those people, uh, influential people uh, that are uh, arrested and all that are taken before the court. But uh, the, the backers of the court uh, claim that the government, backed by the international community, the UN, the United States, the EU, uh, will ensure that uh, the security measures are put in place for the smooth operation of the court. In fact, the, the resolution called for the Liberian government to liaise with the United Nations. Similar uh, uh, situation in Sierra Leone. It should be a United Nations back court. And they should also liaise with the United States government, the EU, for more support. So I think uh, the legislature, they are aware of this and they are doing they are suggesting, and the resolution clearly point out that 
It should not be only a Liberian endeavors. There mm -hmm. should be external uh, powers uh, that will, will, will provide support just in case when there is any problem so that um, um, observers are very keen on uh, what could happen, the implications of the establishment of the court. Right. Right. Now, uh, let me come to you, Aaron Wright, and uh, let's talk about the challenges. The challenges that have been faced to bringing these perpetrators to book. Will this court solve it? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, to begin with, uh, I, allow me to, to make a rough comparison with Liberia and Sierra Leone. Uh, in, 2000, in 1999, uh, the Lome Agreement was signed, and two years later, Sierra Leone had a special court set up, uh, started in, in 2001. Uh, Liberia had the Accra Peace Agreement signed in 2003. And we are now talking 21 years later for the establishment of the court. You see in, in a comparison with Sierra Leone, you see in the comparison with Liberia, uh, a shorter interval in getting a court established, whereas in Liberia, the interval is, is more than, is more than uh, two decades. Uh, so here we, we are dealing with, we, we're dealing with uh, the issue of time, also dealing with the issue of evidence gathering. And we're also dealing with our aging population that experienced the war. Uh, aging population in the sense of uh, testimonies, evidence uh, as, as part of it. So one of the first challenges uh, the court will have to grapple with would have to be the issue of uh, evidence. Uh, going back to, to massacres committed in 1990, that's 34 years ago. You know, how do we, how do we uh, engage with that? The second challenge the second challenge I would like to highlight here is, is the complexity of the Liberian Civil War. Uh, why the people who never committed act, act of murder before took up gun and was involved with murder? Uh, you, this, this, this question uh, comes to mind in, in the sense that every society going through the experience that we are about to embark on is expected to come out better than it was. In October last year, Sierra Leone came to the brink of another uh, major political violence, if you follow. Uh, but this was a country that, that, that entered two, two transitional justice mechanisms. It had a truth commission running simultaneously. It also had a special court for Sierra Leone. That raises a fundamental question with uh, how did these processes impact on the Sierra Leone society? How did Sierra Leone emerge from uh, these experiences? Did they, did they come out as a better nation? These are very uh, 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 searching questions that I'm throwing out there for Liberia because part of uh, the, the, my formulation of this question is, is to really troubleshoot uh, what I see as a simplistic uh, 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 discussion on issues of justice and accountability in Liberia. On the one hand, you see civil society demonizing uh, perpetrators. Uh, on the other hand, it's trying to create a picture that shows that, yeah, this is just a situation of victim perpetrator. No one is trying to interrogate further that some people took our arms because they saw their parents being killed. Uh, some people took our arms because their ethnic group uh, was being persecuted. And some people took our arms because uh, they saw their neighbors uh, pointing them out. Uh, as, so we're dealing with layers, layers of complications in the, in the Liberian conflict. And, and I believe that uh, we can emerge, we will emerge a better society if we are able to have a, a conversation that is all encompassing and not a com conversation that reduces uh, the society into simple binaries as victim perpetrators. The war wasn't as complex as that. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that there has to be dimensions of a difficult conversation. How did Liberia sink so low uh, where 250,000 persons were killed? How were communities complicit in some, some of the most uh, horrific acts of war crimes. Some of these people would never be brought. Uh, uh, some of them would never appear in court. Uh, you may have a few persons appear in court and may be put away permanently, but how does that address the fundamental question of what really happened in Liberia and why? Uh, Gerald, do you have anything to add to, 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 to this to his answer as well in terms of challenges uh, uh, that uh, the court might face? 
You know, yes. Um, he he talked about uh, one of the the, the the important things there is evidence gathering. The war since the war in the years. As you said, it has, has stayed on over 30 years. Some of the crimes are committed over 30 years. So uh, presenting evidence for events that took place more than 30 years ago, definitely it would be a challenge. And then what now? Uh, let's look at the reconciliation process. We'll uh, try these influential people in the community some are, are senators, some are representatives, some are ministers, and they have impacted a lot of people, uh, taking them, uh, trying them, incarcerating them. What will happen in the community? Will it, will it be uh, something uh, that will bring about reconciliation? Will Liberians say, yes, there should be a closure, let's move in? Will it not, will it not upset the community? We in that uh, uh, bring about division among the counties because remember the war was tribal war. Uh, there were uh, people being killed because they were part of certain families, certain tribe. So we we'll, um, uh, taking these influential people out of the county, out of the community, will all lead to more uh, division. So these are some of the questions that uh, that are being asked uh, about the challenges of this of this of this court. But then again, uh, uh, people are saying that it happened in other countries, neighboring several and they are moving on. Uh, beyond the court, the TRC recommendations call for apology, uh, public uh, you know, uh, a remembrance, a garden of remembrance. Maybe it could be a museum to be set up just uh, to show some of the, the legacy of the world, to remind the future that. It is what happened in our country, and it should not happen again. So people who are calling for this code, they are just saying it is not only about the, the code alone, but it goes beyond. So yes, uh, there will be challenges, and, and it just uh, depends on how the government uh, can partner with the, the partners, uh, the international community, to ensure that uh, it ends successfully. But know that there uh, will be some challenges. Mm. Uh, Gerald, many thanks so much for Thank doing you, this with us. Gerald T. Koine is a deputy head of Newsroom Front Page Africa Lib Liberia, as well as Aaron Ware is a director at DECO Institute for Social and Economic Research. And we're talking about uh, Liberia Senate's vote to establish a war crime court in Liberia. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.